Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're passing around a sign-up sheet, so feel free to uh, fill that out. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jonathan Hofer. I am a research associate at the Independent Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you guys here today for our special session at CPAC uh, titled Protecting the Second Amendment. We are delighted to have two distinguished uh, experts, Dr. Stephen Halbrook, who's a senior fellow at the Independent Institute, and Amy Swearer, senior legal policy and uh, analyst at the Heritage Foundation. For those of you new to the Independent Institute, you can find information about our program online as well as on your seats. Uh, the Independent Institute is a nonprofit think tank that sponsors in-depth studies on major social and economic issues in order to boldly advance peaceful and prosperous and free societies with a commitment to human worth and dignity. The results of this work is published in books and other periodicals and form the basis for numerous conference and media programs. Neither seeking nor accepting government funding, we hope that you will join us as an independent member. With the many new attacks on the Second Amendment at the federal, state, and local levels, our session today will examine these threats and how to protect your right to self-defense. Indeed, the Democratic Party's major candidates for nomination for president are unanimous in their agreement that your constitutional right to own and bear firearms should be radically reduced and in many cases completely eliminated. Stephen Holbrook has taught legal political philosophy at George Mason University, Howard University, and the Tuskegee Institute. He received his JD from Georgetown University Law Center and PhD in social philosophy from Florida State University. The winner of three gun issue cases before the United States Supreme Court, his work was cited in both the landmark decisions in Heller and McDonald. His many books include The Founder's Second Amendment, Gun Control in Nazi-Occupied France, and Gun Control in the Third Reich, all of which will be available for purchase today. Today, Dr. Holbrook will be speaking on defending America's rifle, the AR-15. Please join me in welcoming Steve. So thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, we're, we're beset by lots of propaganda terms in our society, and this issue in particular. So um, there's a term I'm not going to use but once today, I think. It's assault weapon. Like, that is such a derogatory term. They might as well have called these rifles they want to ban murder weapons or, or anything like that. And then they have positive terms uh, geared toward their issue or their side of the issue. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke at Penn Law, and they had somebody from every, every town for gun safety. And I asked him, where can I sign up for one of those gun safety classes that you guys offer? And he had no response to that. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I want to talk about is the, the Second Amendment and the um, proposed and, and real, in some states, bans on rifles that are commonly possessed throughout the United States. Um, we just dodged the bullet about uh, 10 days ago in Virginia when our Senate committee voted against a ban on these rifles. There were four Democrats that, who I'm proud of for their votes who voted against it. Um, but w what is the real issue? I mean, we're talking about a constitutional right. The Second Amendment provides that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It has a prefatory clause, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So, I mean, look at the key terms. The right of the people. Keep and bear arms. Arms, hello. Um, rifles, pistols, shotguns. That's the, the main arms in our society. It would also include uh, blunt weapons and edged weapons, uh, which are more historical, obviously. So. That's the issue. Now, for many years, starting in about the 1960s, you had a, an invented theory of the Second Amendment that the right of the people to keep and bear arms really meant the power of states to maintain militias like the National Guard, and there was no 
specific individual who had any right. Um, we challenged that intellectually in law review articles and in books starting in the 70s and 80s. And finally, our, our view became the predominant view in the academic world uh, with the collective rights people hanging on to the extent that by the time the Heller case came before the Supreme Court, um, Justice Stevens argued for an individual right to keep and bear arms in his dissent, uh, but only in the militia service, which was actually a pretty wacky theory. If you have a right of the people to keep and bear arms, it doesn't say limited to the militia, and you don't get to do anything you want to in a militia. It's a military force so that you have uh, a, a command society. Your officer gives orders and you obey. There's no right to do anything in particular. You don't have a right to free speech or assembly or any of these other things in the, mili in the military force, including a militia. So uh, around 1989, California passed the first ban on America's favorite rifle, which I won't call by um, AW. Um, and it had a, a list of evil, wicked, mean and, mean and nasty names and model numbers, manufacturer names and model, uh, model names or numbers. AR-15, Colt AR-15 leading the list. Aftermath Kalishnikov. They didn't know that Aftermath Kalishnikov really meant a full auto um, selective fire machine gun. So uh, that was the first band. And then they started bringing in generic characteristics that I'll talk about a little bit more later, like the, the horrible conspicuously protruding pistol grip that I know you're, you're going to be frightened when I use terms like that, but you'll have to <laughs> excuse me. If you need to leave the room, it's okay. So um, we, we know what the, the terminology of the Second Amendment is, and then if you go to the, the founding period, the words meant exactly what they said, um, like arms and, and militia, the first Militia Act, 1792, passed by the United States Congress. Uh, it required every able-bodied white male to, uh, in a certain age group to provide their own arms and to sign up for militia duty and to muster when ordered to do so. The word white was crossed out during Reconstruction in 1867. Um, and what did you have to provide? You had to have a, a, a musket, which was, was a military-grade weapon. You had to have a bayonet. Um, a bayonet is like a high capacity weapon because you can stab people without limit without ever having to reload. You never give out of ammunition with a bayonet. Uh, or you had to have a rifle, which was a, more of a, a, a sniper weapon at the time and more of a sharpshooter's gun. Or if you rode a horse, then you had to have a, um, two pistols. So those were the arms. Those were the military grade arms. But they were the same arms that people in that society had for hunting for self-protection. Um, they did a lot of shooting matches, so sport. And, and that's the way things stood basically until, as I, as I said, in the 1960s, the uh, propaganda was made up in polite intellectual circles, uh, judges and lawyers in particular, that the Second Amendment only collected, uh, uh, protected a, a collective militia right and not a right of the people. And that was so that any and all gun control laws could be upheld. If there's no Second Amendment right to individuals, then uh, the sky's the limit in terms of the restrictions that you can enact. So finally, um, there were two basic jurisdictions that banned handguns nationwide. Uh, it was the District of Columbia and Morton Grove, Illinois. Finally, Chicago got around to banning handguns as well, and, and, and several other Chicago land uh, localities. And so the Heller case comes along and uh, challenges that. And uh, lo and behold, when the case got to the D.C. Circuit, the D.C. Circuit invalidated the ban. Um, D.C. was horrified. And they thought, well, this should not happen to us. You know, we're special. And so they decided to file a cert petition with the U.S. Supreme Court. And, and mind you, they were urged not to do that by their anti-gun colleagues from states like New York and California and other places. Um, like, don't go to the Supreme Court. What, like, what if they uphold the DC Circuit? And that's exactly what they did. Uh, but nobody knew what was gonna happen. It was kind of, um, kind of like Russian roulette on both sides. No, nobody knew 
how Justice Kennedy was going to vote, for example. And um, I was in the oral argument that day, and uh, having filed an amicus brief on behalf of a majority of members of the U.S. Congress. Um, and so the first time Justice Kennedy spoke, his mouth slowly opened, and time stood still because nobody knew what he was going to say. Because you always figure you can try to gauge what, where a justice is going to go by the questions they ask. And he asked the, um, the uh, attorney for the District of Columbia, Walter Dellinger, um, well, weren't the settlers people who needed to have guns to protect themselves from uh, criminals and Indians and grizzly bears? So never mind there were no grizzly bears east of the Mississippi. <laughs> what, what did that indicate about his thought? Obviously, he intended the Second Amendment to mean as an individual right. And so people in favor of the DC ban, uh, their hearts sunk when he asked that question um, because we figured, and, and we fig our hearts were lifted because we figured that he would, uh, uh, that our side would prevail. And the same thing happened on the last day of the session when the court announced the opinion. So our side had a, a big fright when the Chief Justice said that um, Justice Stevens will announce the opinion in, before he could say the name of the case, you think, Justice Stevens, oh crap, <laughs> that means we lost. And it turned out to be some totally innocuous case. But when he said, Justice Scalia will announce the opinion in District of Columbia versus Heller, then we knew we had won and the other side knew it was, the game was all over. So pertinent to our, our discussion today about the AR-15, by the way, nobody's taking names. How many of you have an AR-15? Like, uh, I'm hope if, if you don't have one, <laughs> if, if you don't have one, you need, you need one. <laughs> so, no, <nah>, well, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> more, more than 10, okay. Um, and in fact, I don't know whether any of you were uh, bought yours about 10 days ago because that was right before the vote in the Senate committee in Virginia um, when it looked like they were headed toward a ban, but uh, the ban that was not to be, at least for now. So um, the, the interesting part about the Heller case was the test that Justice Scalia formulated for what arms are protected by the Second Amendment. And it was basically the kinds of arms that are commonly possessed by law-abiding people for lawful purposes. Very simple. Uh, and handguns were obviously within the contours of that, that formulation. So um, Justice Scalia had a, a number of other really important parts of the opinion. We don't have time to go into all of that, but uh, he said this is a no-brainer. We don't have to have a a level of scrutiny or, or uh, some kind of judicial test for how we decide whether a violation of the right to keep and bear arms is a violation of the right to keep and bear arms. If, if it's a violation, this, is, this law is invalid. Um, Justice Breyer wrote an, a, a dissenting opinion saying that, well, the legislature needs to balance this way and balance that way, and they always balance it in one way. Imagine saying that in a First Amendment case about free speech. Um, and then you get around to Justice Stevens' dissent, and he said, well, you have a right to bear arms in the militia, and that's all. <laughs> so that wasn't going anywhere. So, so the district spokespeople went out in front of the Supreme Court when the decision was handed down and talked about how much harder they were going to make it on gun owners than, than even before. And they said, well, of course, the, the, the decision is incorrect. Um, the Supreme Court just got it wrong. And so they did uh, a couple of things. They made it more difficult to register guns in the district than ever before because you had to register all guns. And then they banned uh, what they should have called America's favorite rifle because I'm not using the term they used because I'm sick of that term because it, it's meaningless and it's their propaganda, not ours. Um, so we thought, hey, you know, this could be a really easy litigation to bring we brought a case, came to be known as Heller II, and we challenged uh, the, this new ban, on, mostly on rifles, because the Supreme Court had just said that the kind of arms that are protected are the ones lawfully, uh, commonly possessed by lawful people for lawful purposes. Um, so we got production figures for the AR-15, and it was 
at that point, I think we, a conservative estimate might have been about four million, I'm not really sure. Now it's probably six million or seven, I don't know, nobody really knows. Um, but it's the most popular rifle in the United States today. So uh, we thought, well, surely, I mean, it, it's a no-brainer. You know, the court said commonly possessed arms are protected. This is commonly possessed. What else do we have to show? So our district judge said, well, um, the police said this is an extraordinarily dangerous weapon. And they said about the magazine ban that, um, well, if, um, uh, if you have to reload after 10 rounds are used up, then that gives police officers a more chance to, to get the bad guy. I mean, that was a superficial opinion, but, but we argued, well, uh, it's a fundamental right, and fundamental rights in, in our jurisprudence uh, get top priority. You use strict scrutiny to look at any gun ban or any ban of any type when that's the standard of, of judicial review. And... Um, and the court had even, and Heller used the term fundamental right twice. And our district judge said, well, they didn't use the word fundamental right enough. That's only twice. And so I'm not going to consider this a fundamental right, and I'm going to uphold everything that the D.C. did based solely on their, uh, the city council's findings that these guns are, are so horrible and dangerous. So we go up to the D.C. circuit, and we thought, uh, surely we'll win there because um, the, of the Supreme Court's form, formulation. And, and lo and behold, that court said, yeah, they're commonly possessed by law-abiding people for lawful purposes. We meet that. But nonetheless, uh, you know, there's always a, a catch. Um, we're going to apply what they called intermediate scrutiny, and they're going to say, well, somebody in the, in the council here, and yet yeah, was a Brady Center lobbyist, said the purpose of a protruding pistol grip is to spray fire and kill as many people as quickly as possible. So a lobbyist said that. We had evidence from like national experts and army uh, or military experts that the purpose of the pistol grip was simply the design of the rifle. It's got a straight line stock. So you know, you know the vocabulary. Uh, it's a straight line stock. It comes straight back, so you have to have the pistol grip. If you had, a, had to grip it like that, that would be exceedingly uncomfortable. And you want to have comfort when you shoot a rifle because you want to hit the target. And um, so that wasn't good enough. They, we had sworn evidence in the case about the purpose of a pistol grip and the other uh, features that were banned. And uh, that was not good enough because the judge did this balancing test. It was Judge Doug Ginsburg. And um, he, in two to one opinion, upheld the ban. So we did get a dissenting opinion. And would anybody like to guess who the dissenting judge was? Maybe some of you know. Like his initials are BK. Brett Kavanaugh. So he wrote a, a dissenting opinion, and he said, we clearly meet the Supreme Court's test, um, common use, law-abiding citizens, lawful purposes, self-defense, uh, hunting, sporting use, target shooting. Um, we should win. Like, at that time, uh, Judge Kavanaugh was not that well known, and, and so for my own part, I kind of forgot about him and, until when the spring of two years ago, was it? <laughs> and uh, I wrote a law review, review article about why our side should have won, and um, that's what you do when you lose a case. How many of you are lawyers, by the way? Is, is anybody here, you know, you ever done that? You lose a case, you should have won. Go write a law review article. That'll show them. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so anyway, w when um, Judge Kavanaugh got the nomination, that was just a, a super day, and, um, we, we don't have a, the, the court hasn't accepted a case at, at this point on this issue on America's favorite rifle, uh, but hopefully they will. So then, then came along, the, the day that Heller was decided, it was already, all the complaints were drafted to, to file against Chicago and the other Chicago land jurisdictions that had handgun bans. And so uh, there were two major sets of litigants, um, the McDonald group and the NRA group and cases were litigated. A lot of the, the local jurisdictions repealed their ordinances because they didn't want to have to be pay the legal fees to uh, defend them. And everybody figured the handwriting was on the wall anyway. With Heller decided, um, the, the, it looked like the, the Second Amendment was going to be held to apply against the states and localities through the 14th Amendment. And that's exactly what the court did in the McDonald decision. 
Um, part of that analysis was the 14th Amendment was adopted uh, primarily to do away with the black codes. And these were reenactments of the slave codes. And these provisions said that um, uh, imposed all kinds of, of legal disabilities um, upon African Americans, uh, even those in the antebellum period who were free blacks and, and were not slaves. Uh, and the one important for our purposes was to carry a gun, you had to get permission of some kind of authority. Um, the very first example of a black code provision that uh, the McDonald case mentions the 14th Amendment meant to do away with was a Mississippi sta uh, state ordinance or, or law s providing that African Americans had to get permission from the authorities in order to carry a gun. That's kind of significant that they picked that particular law because that's about carrying guns. And that's going to get into Amy's topic about the right to bear arms. But um, it's, it's interesting that the the, the um, maybe issue states that we have, uh, the ones who do not have shall issue, is exactly the same thing as that black code provision. You have to get the permission of the authorities, and they decide what the criteria is, whether they think you need to carry gun, a gun. Mm -hmm. um, it's not enough that the Second Amendment refers to the right to bear arms. So the, the McDonald case went on to uh, do another thing I thought was uh, really tickled me. Remember the judge who said this, Heller only mentioned it's a fundamental right twice? Well, if you uh, do a word search on fundamental right in the McDonald case, it's at least a dozen times they said it. It's, it's almost like the court was saying, have we said it enough now that it's a fundamental right? Um, so that, that did away with the, the Chicago and the other um, uh, handgun bans in, in that period. And then um, we start having no more action by the Supreme Court. It was like Mark Twain said, the reports of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. Well, all of a sudden, lo and behold, the Supreme Court um, rendered an opinion. Justice Scalia had died by then. There were only mem eight members of the court. It's called Catano versus Massachusetts. And in that case, the court sent back to the Massachusetts High Court um, their upholding of the stun gun ban in, in that state. The Supreme Court said, you got it wrong. Uh, we had three tests that we provided about uh, the f one of them, for example, that the descendants of the guns that, that were available at the founding are the ones, the kinds of arms that are protected today. And so that, for the most part, that means rifles, pistols, and shotguns, but it also meant that just because it's a newly invented weapon doesn't mean it's not protected, which stun guns were obviously didn't exist at the founding, but, um, th but they met the test of not so much common use, because there weren't anywhere near as many of those as guns, but common enough. Um, and the neat part about that case is that the stun gun was possessed in a parking lot of a supermarket. The Supreme Court could have just said, well, um, there's no right to take a gun outside the home, and, and therefore, we're not going to hear this case. But they assumed that you can take an arm under the Second Amendment outside the home, which should be a no-brainer. But uh, for some, <clears throat> those who are fighting the um, <clears throat> challenges to their May issue carry regimes um, don't like the idea that the Supreme Court uh, assumed in that case that you can take it out of, out of the home. So that, to that, that extent, it was a victory for our side. But the court has turned down other cases up until recently. And one of them was an ordinance from Highland Park, Illinois, which banned America's favorite rifle. Um, you know, wouldn't that be cool if you could um, push a button and these statutes that use that term that I'm not going to use uh, it, and you could make it the language of their statutes saying um, America's favorite rifle is defined as, and then go on to list the characteristics. Uh, then the other part you would want to do is to s mandate that you have one, not that you go to the penitentiary if you have one. So I want to talk about the, um, these characteristics that are banned some. And uh, before I do that, though, um, there was some further litigation in, this, in the circuit courts. 
Um, I mentioned the Highland Park case. The Supreme Court denied cert in that case where they banned America's favorite rifle. And <clears throat> Justice Thomas wrote a dissent from that denial of certiorari. Justice Scalia was still alive then. He joined in with, with that dissent. Basically, Justice Thomas said that this is America's favorite rifle. I think he might have even used a, a term like that in there in the dissent and uh, talked about the millions upon millions of rifles that are um, that are there and um, uh, that are in the hands of lawful civilians in this country. There's been some other cases where there's dissents from denial of certiorari on other issues like um, the um, Peruta case out of the Ninth Circuit upholding discretionary license issuance for concealed, cap, uh, concealed weapon licenses. Thomas wrote a dissent from that and joined by uh, Justice Gorsuch. So, um, and, and now we have one case pending in the court. Um, the same litigant, by the way, who challenged the, uh, the ban on America's favorite rifle in the state of New York. It's a case called New York State Rifle and Pistol Association uh, versus Cuomo. And in that case, uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the ban, upheld the ban. And what's curious about that case and the other ones that have uphold, uh, upheld these bans, they don't talk, they don't say anything about the characteristics of the guns that are banned. Um, it's probably because they don't know what, what they're talking about. They don't know the subject. They probably wouldn't know a muzzle brake from a, a, I know they wouldn't know a muzzle brake from a flash suppressor. Um, th these are judges, they're not educated in terms like that. And, and you have, um, um, you know, they're, they're from cultures where they're not around guns. The only thing about they know about guns is what they saw in the movies. So uh, when you have that kind of culture that judges are growing up in and the, the political operatives who help make them judges, they, they feel the same way. Um, it, it's hard to have an intelligent discussion about the characteristics and how can you justify banning these different characteristics. So, um, so the Second Circuit renders this, I don't know, 60-page six, opinion uh, with a, less than one paragraph discussing the characteristics that are banned. And so how can you justify banning these characteristics? You would think that would be a hot topic for a judicial decision that's, in, that's up upholding a law being challenged as unconstitutional, uh, but not. But what they did you do is about 85 times in the opinion used the propaganda term, the AW term. So instead of talking about what, what's being banned, they just keep using that in every other sentence, it seems like. And, th and that's their way of persuasion. Um, this, is, uh, th this shows how what great jurisprudence we have as judges, that we can use that term over and over and over without end. And, and we can avoid the subject at issue, what's being actually being banned. Um, and, and, and then that gets upheld. <clears throat> there was no cert petition filed after that decision, by the way, because Justice Scalia had died. And it looked like at that point, it was a 4-4 um, divide at the, at the court. That was, uh, a, a new justice had not been appointed yet, and so it was no, no point in filing a cert petition, particularly if it might make bad law. Now, this same New York State Rifle and Pistol Association filed another lawsuit on another subject, and that was New York City banned taking your gun out of your home. So in, in New York, you can get a carry permit only if you're somebody really special. Like the application says that commoners need not apply and deplorables really need not apply. You're not going to get a, a carry permit unless you're really, um, you know, contribute to the right people or whoever, or, or do the right bribes. Um, but you can get a, a premises permit. It might take six months and you might have to pay $800. Uh, but, but what the heck, it's only a, a right that's in the Bill of Rights. So, um, but if you get a premises permit in the city of New York, you cannot take the gun out of the home. So a lawsuit was filed and one litigant, one plaintiff said, well, I want to take it upstate to my upstate second home. And another one said, I'm going to take it uh, to a shooting range or a shooting match. And, but there was an affidavit filed by a um, retired officer, police officer, saying that 
This would be an endanger public safety if you allowed people to take locked up, inaccessible, unloaded guns in their car trunk from their home uh, in the city to some other location. And the Second Circuit said, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> like, uh, you know, here you have the right to bear arms in the Constitution, and here you have some ex-cop saying that this would endanger public safety. Whoa, that's good enough for me, said the judges. Uh, so they upheld that, and uh, you probably know the story since then. The, the city tried to weasel out of that and try to make the case go moot. Uh, argument was held in the Supreme Court on December 2nd, and most of the argument was about mootness. So, so the antis really want that topic to go away. They do not want the Supreme Court to decide any Second Amendment case because not only that would they invalidate a, a law like that, but they would also give guidance for other cases and f give uh, further guidance for uh, how you determine uh, these, these gun bans or these other restrictions that are so on onerous. So now I want to talk about characteristics. Um, I guess I could ask one more question. How many of you put, have put together a kit, um, like an AR kit? Well, <clears throat> they're really fun. <laughs> um, and um, I highly encourage it. But <clears throat> anyway, um, what are the features of these rifles that are so horrible and, and um, dangerous to society? And my favorite one has always been the a pistol grip that protrudes conspicuously beneath the action of the weapon. And, and again, if there's any like faint-hearted people, you, you better leave now because we're going to talk about other features that are extremely scary. So back before Heller, we litigated cases uh, like challenging that definition as, as vague and ambiguous violation of due process. Uh, like a pistol grip that protrudes conspicuously. Like, anybody want to define conspicuously in terms of angles or inches? Like, what if they banned, instead of shotguns with a barrel less than 18 inches, shotguns with a barrel that's conspicuously short? And, and it's really in the eye of the beholder, and it's comparative. Um, because if you had one, if you had a gun barrel only that long, one that was 15 inches, would not be conspicuously short. It's the same token. If you had a pistol grip, like maybe a normal one would be four and a half inches maybe. What if you had one that was like three feet, a pistol grip? So maybe you got a big hand. You need a, a long pistol grip. So that would make the short one inconspicuous. Um, but by and large, these arguments that we made fell on deaf ears in courts because they're clueless what that would mean. and. It, what the heck, it doesn't matter anyway. It's just a, a gun restriction. And the Second Amendment doesn't mean much. So, um, you know, the judges would get laughed at at cocktail parties with their friends if they invalidated a gun ban. So, um, you know, <clears throat> why not? My favorite definition, actually, California tries to define a con conspicuously protruding pistol grip. And it's one in which the web of the hand is... Um, even with or beneath the top of the trigger when the gun is held. So that's a part of the Second Amendment you didn't know about. <laughs> it, a right to keep and bear arms except for those in which the web of the hand is below the top of the trigger when firing. So how frivolous can you get? to say that something's not protected because of where the web of the hand is when you're holding the rifle. I mean, what, what an argument. Um, and yet, the Ninth Circuit has continued to uphold uh, the California bans, and, and other courts have. Um, I think my, my second favorite band characteristic is the telescoping stock. So what's the reason for banning those? Whoa. <laughs> um, I guess it looks scary because it's a tube instead of a, a wooden stock that's kind of flat. But the reason they give for upholding that is that it makes it concealable. So let's talk about, I mean, you might have an adjustment of what, two inches, maybe three at the most. The, the reason for it, obviously, is to make it adjust to your physique. 
so that you've got a, a comfortable fit. You don't want an uncomfortable fit um, because you want to be able to shoot to hit what you're aiming at. So, um, <clears throat> so we've used the we've made the argument in court like, okay, what if at its shorting shortest length, it would be a, a shoulder stock that was four feet long. No, nothing concealable about that. You know, the stock this long and then all the rest of the barrel. Um, but the judge's minds are so tiny they can't understand um, the fact that you, for example, you could set an overall length limit. It might be 26 inches. Uh, some laws are like that on a rifle. No rifles that are under 26 inches overall length. Whether it has a, a telescoping um, stock or not, um, at its, if it's at its shortest. But there's been just some kind of incredible inability to conceive of, of that argument, which is it's so obvious. Um, the folding stock is another one that, that's banned as a characteristic. And um, but by the way, sometimes they talk about, well, we're, these are semi-automatic and, and they're so dangerous and they shoot as fast as machine guns and there's no, in fact, some courts say there's no difference. The Fourth Circuit <coughs> upholding Maryland's ban. There's no real difference between a full auto and a semi-auto. I mean, how incredible is that? Um, but none of these laws ban the rifles because they're semi-auto. It's because they have one or two other characteristics. If it's a rifle, if it's semi-auto, if it has a deta detachable magazine, capacity to accept the detachable magazine, then you look for one or two other characteristics. And that, that's when you go to the list. So far, they haven't banned any rifles just because they're semi-auto. So to justify these bans, you've got to ask, what is it about this characteristic that makes it so bannable? And that's where, as I said, the courts never address that in their, their opinions. Um, <clears throat> one California judge recently uh, held a case called RUPP, R-U-P-P, -P, uh, versus uh, Basaria, I think is the name of the case. The fact that the rifles, because of these features, are comfortable and easy to shoot is the very reason California bans them. Now think about that. You, you can ban some, a rifle under the Second Amendment because it's comfortable and easy to shoot. So if that logic is true, you could make, make it where you could mandate restrictions where you had to have crooked barrels, you had to have uncomfortable stocks, um, you had to have uh, you, you, you can ban sights. In other words, if the whole idea is that you can ban features that make a rifle work well, um, then why not require little people to have big rifles and big people to have little rifles so they, they don't work very well for you, so they're not comfortable? I mean, the, the logic has gotten out uh, that crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to have questions at the end. Uh, so those are some of the characteristics that are banned, and, and, and think about what this gets you. In the um, bill that was just defeated in the Virginia Senate committee, it was going to be a class six felony to have a rifle with any one of those characteristics or to have a magazine more than, uh, that held more than 12 rounds. And it would be a class six felony. You would get a minimum ma mandatory sentence of one year in prison, a maximum of five years. And the best analogy I can find of an, another crime that's a class six felony is unlawful wounding in which you cut, stab, or shoot somebody with intent to kill them. That's also a class six felony. So on the one hand, you're trying to kill somebody, but you don't succeed. And that's, that's one to five years in prison. And, or you have this piece of metal that they don't like, and, and you hurt no one. So um, as I said, we dodged that bullet for now. We'll see what happens next. Then there's, there's the other characteristics. We don't need to go into them in too great detail, I guess. A, a bayonet mount is another favorite. Um, if, if you have the ability to put a bayonet on the end of a rifle, uh, when do you figure was the last person killed with a bayonet on a rifle? Like 1865, maybe? Um, 
and, and, and they're banning just the mount itself, not just the uh, rifle with the bayonet. And, uh, and if you want to talk about historical arms, the ones that were actually mandated for the militia, <clears throat> uh, you were required to have a rifle or a musket with a bayonet under the first Federal Militia Act. And then the flare launcher, if you have a flare launcher. Um, I've actually seen rifles with flare launchers on YouTube, but I've never known anybody who had one. Does, do any of you have that? I, I don't know why you'd have it, unless you have it like, f what are flares for? Emergencies? So um, in, any school shootings lately with flare launchers involved? So they just banned this stuff because somebody gave them the list. <clears throat> um, I'll close. I just want to mention one more thing. The sponsor of this Virginia legislation, um, Delegate Levine, did the YouTube. How many of you saw that? He said, well, an assault, oh, I'm not going to use that term, America's favorite rifle, you use several fingers when you fire it. And he did this motion. He said, you go, you fire it like this. He waved his arms around, kind of like Elizabeth Warren does. <laughs> and... Um, he made some other really incredible statements, but it's all scripted. People, you know, the anti-gun organizations gave him this this list of characteristics that need banning, and he has he's clueless about what any of them mean, and he wants to put you in prison for up to five years for having that. I mean, that's really a war on gun owners, on law-abiding gun owners, to to threaten that uh, that kind of legislation. So I think probably my time is about out for now, and I'm going to. Close there. Thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Thank you so much, Dr. Hallbrook. Our next speaker is Amy Swearer, who is the Senior Legal Policy Analyst at the Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. She received her JD from the University of Nebraska College of Law and she has served in the Lancaster County Public Defender's Office. She has recently testified before the Virginia legislature's attempt to restrict gun ownership, and her talk today is entitled, Bearing Arms, the Second Amendment Outside the Home. Please join me in welcoming her. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hallbrook, and thank you for, to the independent Independent Institute uh, for inviting me to speak today, and thank you guys all for being here. Um, so, as I said, my name is Amy Swearer. I'm a senior legal policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. This is one of my absolute favorite topics to talk about. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm even more excited uh, because I get to stand here in a room um, both with Dr. Hallbrook and with other people I know who are in here who frankly have been doing the legwork for the Second Amendment since longer than I've been alive. Um, so I stand here today certainly on the shoulders of, of intellectual stalwarts, intellectual giants. Um, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Um, so Dr. Hallberg was talking about uh, the AR-15 and semi-automatic rifles. I'm here today to talk about the Second Amendment outside the home. Is this idea of you know, what are our rights in terms of bearing arms? Because when you look at the text of the Second Amendment, that's what it says, right? It, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, and it kind of leaves us in a unique place right now with the Supreme Court. Uh, so as many of you are familiar with, in D.C. v. Heller and McDonald v. Uh, City of Chicago, uh, during 2008, 2010, the Supreme Court very clearly said you have an individual right uh, to keep arms inside the home. It's centered on this right inside the home, but it hasn't really expanded outside of that to say, okay, well, do you have a right to actually bear arms? Um, and so that's kind of where the battle is right now. In fact, there's a, a case that Dr. Hallbrook referenced, uh, this case out of New York, that deals with this sort of preliminary question. The state of New York, specifically the city of New York, said, all right, you can own a gun inside your home. If you want to take it outside your home, good luck with that. You can take it to one of seven places that we deem acceptable, and if you do it without our permission or taking it to you know, somewhere other than these seven places, even if it's your own home outside of the city, if you have a second home, if you go on vacation, you have to leave it in your home. You can't carry it. Um, and, and so this is sort of this preliminary test of, of what are our rights. 
Um, and to give you a little bit of background, I, I think there's a little bit we can glean from where the Supreme Court might go here. Um, it, it sort of gives you a hint into this battle. So in District of Columbia v. Heller, uh, again, that had to do with handguns inside the home. But the Supreme Court, in you know, explaining this right to keep and bear arms, um, sort of in dicta, said, look, um, there are some restrictions that we will consider uh, presumptively lawful, and it hinted at this idea of like these longstanding regulations, what, what it called longstanding regulations on uh, carrying arms in what it called um, sensitive places, like schools and, um, and, and capital buildings and government buildings. Um, those are presumptively lawful. Now, no one really knows what that means, and if it's presumptively lawful, you know, can, it, can that presumption be overturned? But again, what gun control advocates have done is say, look, okay, the Supreme Court said that these are presumptively lawful, and because it's presumptively lawful in some cases, we can ban it everywhere. So what I wanna do today is actually go through the history of sort of debunking this idea of the Second Amendment doesn't protect this right outside the home. Um, I think one of the, the main sort of threads of argument you hear from gun control advocates is that there's this long-standing history in America of regulating people carrying guns outside the home. Um, and so because it's long-standing, because states have been doing this since the beginning of the Republic, of course we can continue to do it. Um, so I, I hope to go through that a little bit today. Uh, and, and so to give you an idea of what the plan is today, I'm just gonna tell you exactly what I'm gonna tell you. Um, so the first thing we're gonna go through is what is the history of public carry laws in the United States? I think what you'll see is that uh, there, there's actually a pretty double standard history. Um, we're gonna get into some of the racial undertones underlying, um, unfortunately, a lot of these public carry laws. Uh, but the reality is, is that Carrying outside the home goes hand in hand with citizenship. It's, it's always been considered that way. Um, and so we're gonna dig into that history. Um, and then we're also gonna take that and we're gonna look at the current impact of uh, some of these restrictive public carry laws. Um, so again, as, as Dr. Halbrook uh, kind of hinted at, uh, lots of different states have lots of different laws regarding public carry and some of them are very, very restrictive. So I wanna look at the impact of that um, and what that actually looks like in reality when we are making it so restrictive and so difficult for people to, to bear arms outside the home. Um, and then I wanna look at um, you know, what is the impact of when we actually uphold that right of bearing arms outside the home. Um, because again, if you take the Second Amendment in context, it says the security of a free state talks about this idea of the security of a free state. Um, and so I wanna look at public carry and this idea of, you know, are we securing a free state when we allow people to carry outside the home? And I think most of you would agree the answer is yes. Um, before we begin, I'd also just like to point out, I am very stoked. There are a lot of women in here. And I'm, it, that makes me very excited. So thank you all. Okay, so let's start with this first idea, this, this what is the history of public carry in the United States? Uh, and again, I talked about this double standard. Um, so we're gonna start with, what is the history of carry laws outside the home for free white citizens? And the reality is free white citizens in this country not only had a right to carry for self-defense outside the homes, but in many places for, throughout the history of this country, you actually had an affirmative duty to carry outside the home, and not just for militia duty. So what you hear sometimes from gun control advocates is, yeah, you could carry outside the home, but it was mostly, you know, when you had to muster for militia duty, um, you, you know, you, you had to carry a rifle outside the, the home for that. But other than that, you know, people just didn't carry outside the home. We restricted it all the time. And it's simply not the case. Um, and so I want to follow this line of reasoning all the way back to, um, if you're familiar with the statute of Northampton from 13... I wanna get this date right. It's 1328, 1328. Um, so what, uh, what gun control advocates will do is they'll point to this statute going all the way back to English common law. And they'll, they'll point to this uh, and they'll say, well, this, this shows us that there is this longstanding history of banning the carrying of firearms outside the home. So I wanna read you this statute and you're gonna hear it and you're gonna be like, am I reading Chaucer to you? So remember, this is 1328. So this is what the statute actually says. It says that no man, great nor small, of what condition so e'er he be, 
except the king's servants in his presence and his ministers in executing the king's precepts or of their own and such as may be in their company assisting them and also upon hue and cry made for uh, hue and cry for arms to keep the peace in the same in places where such acts happen be so hardy to come before the king's justices or any of the king's ministers doing their office with force and arms nor bring no force in a fray of the peace nor go nor ride armed by night or by day in fairs markets uh, nor in the presence of justices or ministers, nor in no part elsewhere upon pain of forfeit of their armor to the king and their bodies to, the per to prison of the king's pleasure. Now I know a lot of you just heard that again, thinking, what is this, Chaucer's England, because this is 1328. So basically what this statute does is it, it creates what we would consider today th this idea of um, brandishing firearms in public. Um, so never mind that our second amendment isn't based directly on 14th century common law. Uh, especially 14th century common law created by monarchical edicts. Uh, but the reality is, is that what this statute does not do is ban carrying outside the home. So it's very clear from the case law after this um, and from the text itself, when you read it, it's talking about carrying arms, uh, what it says, in a fray of the people. So it's this idea of carrying arms in a manner that terrifies people, that causes them to be afraid. Um, in other words, it's exactly the type of criminal statutes we already have on the books today, where you know, if I were to go out just waving my guns at people, threatening to shoot them, we'd all agree that's not a legitimate use of carrying my firearms, um, whether it's considered terroristic threats, whether it's considered uh, brandishing, in some cases it's considered assault, um, that these are criminal acts. Um, and, and so it's these statutes that are actually sort of the, the modern day versions of the statute of Northampton. Um, and so I say this is sort of the, the one strain of restrictions on firearm carrying outside the home that you do see um, both in England and then in state sort of as it progresses up through the Republic is this idea of these, these statutes of Northampton. That yes, if you're going around terrifying people with your guns, um, doing things that are reasonably causing them to be afraid in public, um, that this is one of the restrictions we do see. And I think it's a restriction we agree is reasonable. But what that does not translate into is saying that we have a longstanding history of simply banning guns and the carrying of guns outside the home. Um, and I, I think where you see this too is, is when you actually look at the states that enacted these types of statutes early in, in the Republic, these you know, carrying in the affray, these bans on that type of thing. Um, how did they actually explain these statutes? Um, so again, one of the, the states that had these was North Carolina. And we actually look at an 1840 case, uh, State v. Hunt Huntley, uh, where the Supreme Court of North Carolina explains, you know, what, what does it mean to go carrying into a fray? This is what State Court of North Carolina actually says. It says, the carrying of a gun per se constitutes no offense. For any lawful purpose, either of business or amusement, the citizen is at perfect liberty to carry his gun. It is the wicked purpose and the mischievous result which essentially constitute the crime. He shall not carry about this or any other weapon of death to terrify and alarm, and in such a manner as will naturally terrify and alarm a peaceful people. In other words, again, yeah, if you're carrying a gun peaceably, that's perfectly fine, that's acceptable. This is, uh, and it talks about later in this case, you know, this is their right under the state constitution, uh, which mimicked the second amendment. Um, but what you can't do is use your guns to terrify people. Um, and so again, that's one of the few exceptions to this general rule uh, of being able to carry your gun outside the home. And the second uh, sort of, I guess, strain of laws that you will see um, is that sometimes early on, some states did uh, favor certain modes of carry over others. Um, so for the first 25 or so years of, of this nation's history, so after the ratification of the Constitution, no state, no state, had a general prohibition on either concealed or open carry. Um, so again, that means you were able, if you were a free white man, to carry outside the home. There were no restrictions on this whatsoever. By 1850, uh, when we had about 30 states, there were eight states that restricted the mode of carry. So eight states that um, specifically concealed carry, that said you cannot conceal carry, but there were no general prohibitions on open carry. Um, and the reason for that goes back to this sort of idea that it's now sort of foreign to us, 
um, but that it was the honorable mode of carry to, to have it visible for people to see. That when you were concealed carrying, when you were concealing that gun, it was presumed that you were writing about it in order to, to, to do something underhanded, um, either, either to, to prey upon someone uh, that didn't know you were armed, um, to conceal the fact that you were doing something you shouldn't have been doing, uh, but that the honorable mode was to say, hey, I'm armed, come at me. Um, and, and I know it's kind of flipped now where, where people sort of look down on open carry. Um, but again, so what you had is a minority of states for the first 100 years of this republic who said, we're gonna regulate the mode. Um, but other than that, carry. Um, and again, uh, you see almost no other limitations on this except for these two very limited effects when it comes to free white citizens. Um, and my favorite sometimes, and you see this a lot of times in, in amicus briefs um, for gun control advocacy groups, they'll point to sometimes um, a handful of prohibitions in wild west towns in, in the 19th century. Um, and and they'll, they'll point to these, say look, these wild west towns, sometimes not even in states, but in, in what were then still territories, um, when you had a lot of uh, cowboys coming in, um, you know, sometimes they'd say, okay, look, there are saloon districts you can't carry guns into. Um, and, and I think they, they generally point to, I think, like tens, I'd hesitate to call them cities. Um, they say, look, okay, so this shows that this is a longstanding prohibition. Uh, I forget who it was. It might actually have been Dr. Hallbrook, but I, I know people have actually gone back and looked at the population of, of these cities at the time. And they flipped it, and what they've said is, you can't look at this and say, oh, well, this shows that most places were carrying, or were, were prohibiting carrying outside the home. What it shows is that almost no one was prohibited from carrying outside the home. I think the largest city was Lincoln, Nebraska, which today doesn't even, I did my law school in Lincoln, Nebraska, great city, still doesn't crack the top 50 in terms of, of population. Um, so for the vast majority of Americans, free white citizens, carrying outside the home was a, absolutely a thing that was never prohibited. Now. Um, I think one last example I'm, I'm going to show uh, to sort of make this point, because I, I, I want to hammer this home. Um, what you'll hear gun control advocates say is, well, yeah, so people had guns, but it wasn't common for them to carry. So they may have been allowed to carry, but again, unless they were going to malicious service, they weren't actually carrying outside the home. So I want to use an example from here in, in D.C., um, just, just across the river, which today is notorious for what? It's very strict. Uh, gun laws. So I've um, been recently reading a book by Joan Freeman called uh, The Field of Blood, where it goes through some of literally the congressional fisticuffs that were happening on the, the floor of the House and Senate in uh, the 19th century. Um, and, and some of these passages blew my mind because what it shows us is just how far from reality that this idea of, oh, people never carried outside the home. You know, the, the framers, the founders, earlier generations, they had no idea what would happen if people carried outside the home and how dangerous it would be. Um, it's just, just how, how bunk and absurd that really is. Um, so uh, the author of this book writes, in 1845, um, during a, a Giddings anti-slavery speech, so an anti-slavery speech on the floor of the house by an anti-slavery advocate, in what may rank as the all-time greatest display of firepower on the floor of the House of Representatives, Representative Dawson, clearly agitated, vowed that he would kill Representative Giddings, and he cocked his pistol, bringing four armed Southern Democrats to his side, which prompted four Whigs to position themselves around Giddings, <laughs> several of them armed as well. After a few minutes, most of the pistoliers sat down. Um, and, and there's just a plethora of these examples where on the House, and Senate floors, people were bringing pistols, they were armed, they, I mean, granted, I don't think we wanna go back to the days of duels, and I don't think anybody is, is advocating that, but this, this idea that they had no idea, people were never carrying outside the home. No, their response to people being jerks with their guns outside the home was, here's a pistol yourself, defend yourself. Um, so, uh, of course, they, they had a, a semblance of sanity and understood uh, what it was for people to be armed outside the home. Um, now, I, I said there was sort of a, a double-edged history here, and that's what I want to hit on next. So there is a strain of carry laws prohibiting uh, the carrying of firearms. These were never for free white citizens. Firearm ownership, firearm carry, went so hand-in-hand -hand with citizenship that when gun laws were enacted, it was almost universally in order to keep slaves and minorities in their place to ensure 
that they could not, uh, uh, again, do, do what you would imagine the Second Amendment is there for, which is enforce your inalienable rights um, against those who would deprive you of them. That was the unanimous reality of gun control. It was not for free citizens. It was for the enslaved. And so these sort of racist arms laws predate the establishment of the United States. And they go all the way back, starting with 1751, as you can see, the French Black Codes in Louisiana. It not only uh, said that, that black people could not bear arms, but that if you were a white person, you had an affirmative mandate. If you saw a black person carrying any sort of weapon, whether it's a firearm, whether it's a cane, you suspected this. You actually had an affirmative duty to stop them and to beat them until they were disarmed. Um, and uh, if necessary, um, and you were on horseback, you also were authorized to shoot to kill. Um, New Spain did the same thing in, the, in some of the Spanish colonies dating back all the way to the, the 16th century, um, prohibiting all black persons, um, whether slave or free, from carrying arms. Um, and, and you saw this even up into the, the, the antebellum period, in, into the, the prior to the Civil War, um, where this fear of minorities being armed was so ingrained um, that in Maryland and Mississippi, even free blacks were prohibited from owning dogs because they were afraid that they would train the dogs to attack white people as part of a slave uprising. Um, this reality really comes to a head in the antebellum South, um, where, where you start seeing um, a lot of these permitting uh, displays first come in uh, after Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831. Um, so Virginia's response uh, to this rebellion, to our ever-loving shame, was to prohibit even free blacks from keeping and bearing any firearm of any kind. Um, they could not have powder or lead. And they repealed previous laws um, that prior to that had allowed free blacks to obtain licenses to, to, um, uh, to so they, they could uh, obtain a license to bear arms in some circumstances. Um, you saw even Tennessee changed its constitution to reflect that the right to keep and bear arms was only for free white men. Um, and then in 1840, um, uh, North Carolina did the same thing, implemented a, a prohibition. The first prohibition in that state was for uh, the prohibition on free Negroes, mulattoes, and free persons of color, prohibiting them from keeping and bearing arms. Um, Kentucky similarly, up to this point, had a, a licensing requirement, um, but that was only for free blacks and slaves. And Kentucky at that time was a frontier state, and so the bigger fear was actually, uh, when this law was enacted, was from Indian uprisings. Um, and, and so there were licensing requirements there where some slaves could be armed, but namely because they were more scared of Indians in a frontier state. So then what happens is, is after the Civil War, uh, again, as Dr. Halbert kind of hints at here, um, one of the big driving forces behind the 14th Amendment was this idea of the southern states wanting to disarm black people, of getting rid of these black codes. Um, because again, everyone recognized that hand in hand with citizenship, which was now being bestowed on the freedmen, went the right to keep and bear arms. And up until that point, your right to bear arms was only protected under your state constitution. And so, of course, in southern states where they were quite miffed at the idea of, of being free citizens with, with these now freed men, uh, what they said was, okay, fine, we're going to enact these black codes. Uh, and so then we had the 14th Amendment uh, essentially to, to stop this idea of disarming freedmen uh, with these roving bands of, of white militiamen who were going around, when you read the, the reports from the Reconstruction era, literally going around at gunpoint, forcing freedmen back into slavery. Um, and so you have the 14th Amendment to say, no, we're setting a floor for states. This is a fundamental right um, uh, that, that cannot be taken away even under your state constitution. And so then what you see is this use of race-neutral language for permitting laws. Um, so the former states of the Confederacy, many of which had, had recognized prior to the Civil War this right for free white men to, to bear arms outside the home, all of a sudden developed this very um, quick willingness to qualify that right. And the way they qualify it uh, is um, essentially to say, okay, fine, you have to get a permit, or you can't have it, or we're gonna prohibit it, but in reality, if you were black, that's only when it was enforced. If you were white, you were getting a permit easily. We're not going to enforce it. Um, and I think what, just one of the many examples of this, you see this in Texas, where in 1859, so right before the Civil War in Cochran v. State, the Supreme Court in that state recognized a right to carry defensive arms um, and that this was protected both under the federal and the state constitution in Texas. 
um, to, to the point where the outer limits of the authority in that case were just whether the state um, could, could do any attempt whatsoever to regulate the carrying of Bowie knives. Um, and they said no. Um, and yet by 1872, Texas had flipped because again, now, now you have this, this fear of, of minorities being armed. Texas flips where the Supreme Court there decides that uh, you don't have any right whatsoever under state or federal constitution to keep and bear arms outside the home. And it makes no attempt to explain this, um, but you see sort of through some of the legislative history that it was very much um, racially motivated. Um, and I think to, uh, to, to give you one more example, um, so Florida did the same thing in, in 1883. It passed a statute prohibiting uh, the possession of firearms whatsoever, not just outside the home, but the, the possession generally. Um, and so in 1941, um, as this law is still on the books, uh, a man was convicted of having a, a handgun inside of his um, glove compartment of his truck. And he is a white man. And this case makes it all the way up to the Supreme Court of the state of Florida. And the state of Florida, uh, or the Supreme Court of Florida says this law is invalid. And in one of the concurring opinions, this was amazing to me. This is in 1943. This is one of the, the justices of the court saying, I know something of the history of this legislation. The original act of 1893 was passed when there was a great influx of Negro laborers in the state. And the act was passed for the purpose of disarming Negro laborers and to give white citizens in sparsely settled areas a better feeling of security. The statute was never intended to be applied to the white population, and in practice has never been so applied. Um, and this was incredibly common. So again, you see this sort of double-edged history um, of citizenship going hand in hand, um, and freedom going hand in hand with being able to carry outside the home, and that when gun control is enacted, it's to suppress people who you know, we'd rather not see armed in, in a very racial undertone. Um, so what you hear from gun, gun control advocates today is, well, well that, that may have been the case back then. It's not the case today. Um, you know, we, we, we've since grown out of that. Our gun control laws uh, are, are very race neutral. It applies to everyone. And I want to uh, talk really quickly about how, frankly, it's one, in effect, not the case. Um, but two, we, we still even see this in the 20th century. Um, so as many of you are uh, aware of, in California, there is no open carry of firearms. Um, there's barely even concealed carry of firearms. And the reason for this goes back to 1967. If you're familiar with what was going on in 1967, there were a lot of uh, racial tensions, a number of race riots across the country. Um, and the Black Panthers in that state had started, um, some people refer to it as, as cop watching, but uh, essentially um, a, a sort of a civil rights protest, uh, carrying firearms publicly in the open, especially in, in some of predominantly black and, and Hispanic neighborhoods. Um, and they protested on the, capital of, uh, on the Capitol grounds in the state of California, open carrying. And within the span of five months, um, love Ronald Reagan, but again, much, much to our dismay here as governor of California, this was uh, passed uh, almost in direct response to Black Panthers carrying firearms in California. And uh, that, that long-standing allowance of open carrying California was repealed, um, and that's still the law in the books today. Um, and, and I think that that's fairly common when you look at when a lot of these carry laws were implemented. It's during the sort of civil rights era. Um, same thing in D.C. D.C. had open carry up until now. Do you want to carry permit in D.C.? So the good news is, public service announcement, you can get a concealed carry permit in the District of Columbia. Those are the regulations governing how and when and where to get it. So I'm an attorney. I read this and said, what the ever living heck are you talking about? And had to call other attorneys to help me interpret it. Um, so this is the reality of, of when, when states start implementing very restrictive concealed carry. So you have people like myself who look at this and go, what are, what are we doing? Um, and uh, I, I'm gonna break this down very quickly into what does this actually say? Um, and, and this is fairly common uh, in terms of what it takes to get a concealed carry in some of the more restrictive states. Um, so first, if you're not in, the in D.C., you need to get a concealed carry permit in the state of your residency. You have to complete a 16-hour class, uh, two hours of range training, turn the paperwork in, in person, during business hours, 
at the one location in DC where you can do this, wait 45 days for approval, hope all the information is correct, hope you're not threatened with your life during that time period, and renew it every two years. So this took me about six months, uh, about six or $700 total. Um, when I got the permit, it was incorrect and I had to go get that information fixed. Um, so th this is what it takes. So for me, at this point in my life, when I got this permit, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was an inconvenience. It, it wasn't fun, but it was something I could do. Um, you know, it was like taking out another student loan payment in order to pay for it. Um, but I had weekends free. I could do a 16-hour class. My boss is amazing. I could say to him, look, can I take the morning off to go do the range training? Um, you know, I didn't have childcare. I, I didn't have other responsibilities. I had a car to get me to the range in Virginia because there are no public ranges in DC to do the range training. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't have to deal with, um, you know, finding childcare or, um, you know, any of that sort of stuff. But for a lot of people in the district, for a lot of people in a lot of situations, this is almost prohibitive. And that's on top of the fact that if you're not scared by the 13 pages of regulations trying to explain to you how to get it in the first place, and, and then you go through this. And the reality is, that what this is actually doing is continuing in many respects that same thread of disarming one, poor people, and two, minorities. And, I, and I, to show you this, I'm gonna show you this map. So on the far left side, where it says crime map, what you're seeing uh, is a view of the district uh, with all of the uh, violent crimes committed in the last two years. Um, so, so all of the violent crimes uh, uh, committed with weapons. What you're seeing in the middle is um, the, the breakdown um, by family income. So the, with red being poorer areas and green being higher income areas. What you're seeing on the far right is the demographic breakdown of the District of Columbia by residency, with uh, blue being uh, African American, yellow being uh, Hispanic, and red being white. And it, this amazed me when I saw it, because it is exactly what so many concealed carry advocates and open carry advocates have been saying for so long, that the people who are least likely to be impacted by violent crime on a daily basis, frankly, they're, they're people like me, upper middle class white people who live in very safe neighborhoods, who can take time off of work, who don't have to find childcare, who, who you know, where it's a, it's, a, it's a major inconvenience, but we can do it. Whereas the people who are most likely to be impacted by violent crime on a daily basis, whose rights mean the most to them, just as a matter of statistical reality, are the people who are least likely to look at those 13 pages and say, ah, yeah, I can find $700 lying around, I can find 16 hours off work on a weekend, and then go back you know, the, the next week to do range training. It's a continuation, whether we intend it or not, it's a continuation of that idea of the Second Amendment is a privilege for rich white people. And it's embarrassing. It really is. This is what, this, this is in effect when, when states have, whether it's May issue, um, whether it's restrictive regulations like this. Um, so let's talk about May issue for a second. Um, th this idea of you have to beg the government for permission to carry a gun outside the home. When you look at Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, I think there's something like only 300 concealed carry permits issued in Los Angeles County. When you look at the demographics of it, so again, it's not in any way reflective of the demographics of LA County. It's largely, and actually in some cases, uh, not just white people, but white people who are friends of that particular sheriff. You see the same thing in New York where there's been horrible allegations of graft. To, to get a uh, concealed carry permit in New York City, a lot of times you have to bribe people uh, just to defend yourself. And so that's what it's doing. And that's not to say, you know, I hate this idea of, oh, you know, minorities, poor people, they're too stupid to figure out how to do a concealed carry permit. These are actual real barriers. There's financial restraints. It's time restraints. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's restraints that are very real and tangible to people. Um, so, for example, when I lived in Nebraska, I was a student in Nebraska. Um, I could open carry, but I, I never got my concealed carry permit. So this is a broke student who would have had to take a four hour class and pay something like $300. My rent at the time, this is Nebraska, my rent was $300 a month. There's a month's rent for me to get a concealed carry permit that I couldn't carry on campus. Um, and so these are the types of things that we're doing with these, these permitting requirements. 
And very quickly, because I do want to get to questions, um, I, I want to talk about the security of a free state, uh, you know, the, the protection of the public. So you, you hear this idea from, um, it's been especially prominent in the last year or so from, from uh, groups like Violence Policy Center, this idea of, well, we don't know who these people are, they, these people who are carrying in public, which, by the way, is, is bunk. These are people who have gone specifically to the government who have proven that they are not you know, felons, that they are law-abiding citizens. We know exactly who they are. That's the point of a concealed carry permit. Um, but though they're, they're, they're dangerous. You know, they're, they're, they're committing all of these crimes outside the home. The reality is law, uh, concealed carry permit holders, people who are carrying regularly, it's about 19 million of us at this point. Statistically, some of the most law-abiding citizens in the country as a group. So when you look at the, the percentages of, of concealed carry permit holders who have their concealed carry permits revoked um, for whatever it is, whether it's they leave the state or they, they commit a disqualifying crime, it's actually a lower percentage than the percentage of law enforcement officers who are convicted of crimes and lose their gun privileges every year. Um, and when you look at this, so, so this is the graph that you're looking at. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. John Lott, for, for this graph. Um, what it's showing is in blue, that's the violent crime rate uh, per 10 million people since uh, the mid-1990s. It's been going down, um, whereas the percentage of concealed carry permit holders and just the sheer number, it's been increasing exponentially uh, over the last 20 years. Um, and, and so th this idea of when we allow people to defend themselves in public, it's putting the public in danger. One, it's, it's objectively, as an objective measure, untrue. That is not what is happening. Um, you know, when you look at the stats on this, you, you see that uh, depending on the year in the study, roughly between 500,000 to two or three million defensive gun uses every year in this country. A lot of those are in the home, but a lot of those are also out in public. Um, and so, um, you know, th this idea that, that we're endangering the public by allowing people to simply bear arms outside the home, um, I mean, I can't point to, to, to anything better than this graph. Like, it, it is objectively not the case. Um, and I do want time for questions, um, and I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, so I, I think I may actually turn it over here to, to questions, if, if you're okay with that. So I'm sorry I arrived here a little bit late. I don't know if you addressed red flag laws, um, but there is a legislative bill that was passed in 2015 uh, under the guise of health care called MACRA, and MACRA is a database-driven health care bill that um, has allowed physicians in, in s numerous states to now ask patients if they own a gun, where they keep their gun. They can ask children whether or not their parents, if they know where their parents keep their gun and all sorts of invasive questions. When, and all of this goes into a database for, that's forever. And uh, you know, in, in the wrong hands, it's all we know how, of course, we know how secure databases are. <laughs> I mean, even Citibank, if they can get hacked, almost anyone can. So my question to you is, um, it, considering the, the red flag laws in different states and then what's been happening in especially the large Democrat stronghold cities, what they've done with the bail bond, bail law, bail bond laws in New York. There's major cities in Texas, Houston, Austin, Dallas. The same situation's happening in every one of those cities, and the crime rates have skyrocketed. Um, thefts have been happening. I, a lady at a department store told me that this now that they're allowed to steal a cert, up to a certain dollar amount without any repercussions, that they steal, they have a guy that comes into the department store and just uh, takes about $750 worth every day because he knows there's no repercussions for that. And then, of course, with the murder and crime rates, they've lowered the definition on those things, so they know that th even that is um, not as, the repercussions for, for committing those crimes are not as bad. So women, I think, it endangers women in particular, for, first of all, that because they tend to look for women to, to you know, the easier prey. And, um, but then, you know, I mean, it just endangers society overall. So, um, so it's almost a catch-22 with what they're doing to make society more vulnerable, yet trying to take our guns away from us at the same time. I'll just say something about red flag laws. 
we've had laws on the books a long time that are good laws about mental commitments. And if you're a person who's a danger to yourself or someone else, or that's an allegation, you need to be checked out. There needs to be a mental commitment, a screening. You need to have counsel uh, if they're going to hold you. So uh, most states, or probably all states, have had that for a long time. The red flag laws say, well, uh, we're not going to necessarily help them or take them in or get them off the streets. We're just going to take their guns. And it's based on being denounced. There's an allegation that one side can make and your guns can be seized without any opportunity to be heard at all or even notice. So uh, these are basic due process violations. Uh, it's gotten to be quite a fad to, to pass these red flag laws, so-called. But uh, the problem with them is it deprives you of a constitutional right, and it does so through an unconstitutional procedure. And your typical judge is going to say, well, I don't want to take a chance on these allegations being true. Then they'll just blame me, so I'm going to issue the order. So then they take your gun for one year. Uh, you might get it back after the year, or the order might be renewed. But once again, the bottom line is if, if, if it's really true you're a danger to yourself or others, they need to take you in for observation and see if they can help you. Thanks. Uh, great information. Learned a lot today. Um, when you talk about, and it's kind of frustrating that you see, we hear about all the new conservative judges, et cetera, but yet the anti crowd just keeps on pushing and pushing and pushing. Can we get something, or what can we do, what can happen that gets something to the Supreme Court that then, what you mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Albrook, about now even municipalities aren't going to do it because they know they're going to have to get, they're going to get shot down legally, it's not worth it. They seem to be emboldened by keep on challenging and, and, and arbitrating these things in the courts. Can we get something from the high court? What would it take that... What, what would we have to win at the Supreme Court that now that will become the law of the land and we're not going to continue to have to face these nuisance kind of things? So I, I share that frustration. Um, and I, I think one of the good things is you, you are starting to see, um, at least now, like, like we've said there's a case pending uh, the New York Pistol and Rifle Association one um, that hopefully... I, I think everyone is of the same opinion that that regulation will be struck down. Uh, the question will be sort of what the court does with it, whether it's a very narrow ruling that says, look, yeah, there's a right outside the home, we're not going to tell you what it is, but wherever that line is, you know, this was too extreme, um, or whether they give a very robust ruling that says, no, this is what the right is outside the home. Um, and I think until, so you're seeing those cases be challenged. It's, it's not as though people are not um, legislating or uh, not uh, litigating this. Um, the, the question becomes, um, so mo most of these states where you're seeing these laws are in circuits um, that are upholding the laws, whether it's the Second Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, um, but then you have states like Texas who, you know, aren't passing these laws, but if, the, so you're not having the sort of split circuit scenario because does that make sense where the 10th Circuit isn't having to uphold that? Um, but I, I think you are starting to see the Supreme Court starting to want to take on these cases. Um, I think whatever they do in June with New York Pistol and Rifle will probably give us an indication of, you know, sort of how seriously they're going to start taking this in the future. Um, but are you, it, saying, are you saying if that one gets through and it gets interpreted a little more widely, then maybe we can get America's, maybe a, a case with America's favorite rifle can get up there and then that stuff will then... Too. Look, there's several cases piled up, uh, you know, people knocking at the door, and the courts just kept them waiting. And uh, I think the court's waiting to see what they're going to do in the New York case, uh, because different issues, but they, they give more jurisprudential uh, guidance when they render an opinion. So um, it's not that, that people haven't been bringing these challenges, it's that the Supreme Court has not granted certiorari on them. That, that includes the, the right to America's rifle and the right to carry all the, all the big issues. So um, that's up to the Supreme Court. And of course, the justices on our side are going to maybe pick and choose. And like they don't want to vote for hearing a case where they think the other just, a majority of the justices are going to prevail adversely to that. So. Um, I think the bottom line is we need some more uh, judges, uh, more uh, Trump nominees up there. <laughs> that, that would be very helpful. And it's been very helpful that there's been more judges appointed 
uh, that's been incredibly helpful and it will continue to be so in the future. So, um, so, so yeah, so, so one last thought on this too, um, because I know that's, that's a lot of, well, here's what the Supreme Court can do. Um, from a, a more like individual standpoint, I, I think there are things that we can do as individuals, and I think one of the primary things we can do is keep insisting on our right and, and our ex, our, and our exercise of those rights, whether it's you know, getting those concealed carry permits so that there are numbers for people to say, no, actually Americans are not over the Second Amendment. They are very much insisting on that right. Um, you know, whether it's um, the, the, the sort of uh, rallies that you're seeing, I, I know Virginians literally took up arms over this. Um, you know, but, but those sorts of, of exercises, whether it's from the sheer numerical standpoint of, no, look, uh, pe people are getting concealed carry permits, people are buying these firearms, um, you know, people are writing their legislators. Um, but to keep insisting that, yeah, we are Americans, we are free uh, citizens of this country, and we have a Second Amendment right, and we're going to insist on it, uh, that is, I think, one of the biggest things we can do right now while we're waiting for this to, to work its way through the courts. Oh, I mean, first of all, um, thank you to Amy for the wonderful testimony you gave at, uh, with Diana Mueller at uh, the, and the whole work I've been following you for years. Um, I think what you, you know, the, the thing that bothers me about the gun community is that we're trying to rely on uh, the Supreme Court and things to solve problems that have already happened. And uh, one of the things I, I just spoke about in Arizona was we're creating our own problems by not, a lot, not getting our people out to vote and to get the right people in office because these hoping that the Supreme Court picks up a thing is a losing scenario because we're only going to be lucky as long as we have good you know, officers or good leadership in place. But anyway, that's my point for the day. So I to thank you too. So. For Dr. Holbrook, where are we at on these cases where uh, a guy builds a gun in his garage or a CNC machine shop makes their entire AR-15 out of materials that never went into interstate commerce, and they claim it's not subject to federal law. So um, there's no federal law against building your own rifle or handgun or shotgun. Uh, the only thing that's required is if you're engaged in the business of manufacture, you have to get a manufacturer's license and serialize the gun. Uh, and then it goes through the FFL distribution change, uh, chain, and, and you have records up to that point, and finally the first retail purchaser, and you're good to go. So uh, you can make your own gun. There's some states now passing laws. Uh, California is a good example where if you do that, you have to serialize it, you have to engrave it, and put information on it, and, and register it. California basically has a registration system now. So um, I don't expect the federal law is going to change. And one, th one other thing, if you haven't heard about it, there's been three district court decisions now saying that an AR lower is not a receiver, uh, not a frame or receiver, and it's not. You have to have the upper to go with it. And cases have been dismissed involving various issues uh, based on the fact that to be a frame or receiver, it has to have provide the housing for uh, the firing components, and it has to include the, um, the bolt or breech block. And ATF has gotten away with for years of prosecuting cases uh, based just on the lower receiver. Anyway, it's kind of a, an interesting twist, and we'll see what comes with that. But I don't expect the federal law to change anytime soon, absent some major political change in Congress and the executive branch. Uh, I have a question. What's, what states have constitutional carry? Because I'm from New Hampshire, and I don't think a lot of these things have been discussed really are litigated as far as uh, you know, concealed carry or LTC or stuff like that. Do you know where you can find out like what states, like is it Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Hampshire? Yeah. Where do you find that information out? We need this for the audio. It's on the oh, okay. <laughs> My question was, what states have constitutional carry? It's on the internet. And really? It is. What is it? Ten states with constitutional carry. Um, so, constitutional carry, for, for those of you who aren't aware, um, is uh, th this idea of 
like, are you a law-abiding citizen? Yeah, okay, you can carry without a permit. Um, you know, it's sort of uh, replicating this idea of, look, criminals, are, anyone who is, is intent on, on committing harm, um, who is willing to break laws about murder and robbery, they're not gonna care that we tell them to get a permit or not get a permit. They're gonna carry uh, regardless. And so basically all you're doing is punishing law-abiding citizens. Um, so a, a number of states, um, again, I, th I think the number may be up to 10. Um, if you're a resident of that state or, or otherwise you know, fit within someone who's not prohibited from, from keeping and bearing arms, you, you're able to carry without a permit. Um, I, so when, when we say it's, it's on the internet, um, I, we don't mean that facetiously or, or sort of a, a jab. It really is, I think, the, the best place to get information on this. Um, and, and that's part of the problem with uh, how all of our state by state, you know, this, this web work of, of laws are set up, um, you know, to, to give you an example of some of the problems it causes, um, I wanted to go down to uh, South Carolina with my family to vacation down there just a couple weeks ago. So I have, I'm a Virginia resident, I have a Virginia permit. Uh, my father uh, lives in the Pacific Northwest and has a permit in, in his state up there. I could carry my gun down to South Carolina, my father could not because South Carolina recognizes my permit, but does not recognize my father's permit, even though, frankly, my father had to jump through more hoops to get his permit than I did. Um, and so it, there's just this sort of patchwork of regulations um, between you know, whether you have a resident permit or a non-resident permit or um, you know, what state you reside in um, or, you know, so, so honestly, it's it, the, the best uh, advice that I can give, I'm, I'm not your attorney, I can not representing you, I can't give you legal advice. The best advice that I can give is if you're gonna travel somewhere with your firearm, you need to know what state you're going through and you need to know the regulations in those states. And the best way of doing that um, is, is looking it up online. There are a number of websites um, that are fairly user-friendly uh, that I, I found have very up-to-date laws. But wasn't reciprocity uh, a legislative thing happened a couple years ago as far as some states saying, we honor reciprocity from the state. Yeah, so, so there, there are, um, I think a set of, I think it's 36, 38 states that are generally reciprocal of each other. But again, it depends on what state you're in that, that they'll reciprocate. Um, there, there have been at, at the federal level a number of attempts to pass a federal, either a federal permitting system for concealed carry um, or you know, a federal reciprocity that sort of sets a standard to say, look, if you have this permit and you meet this standard, um, you, you cannot deny uh, the, the ability of people who meet this standard to carry in your state. Um, and, and there have been various attempts at that. I don't know if you want to touch on that more or... Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff on the agenda for the first two years, and none of it got anywhere, unfortunately, or not much of it did. Silencer deregulation and uh, right to transport. Uh, we have a federal law in the books now where you can go through states that are restrictive as long as the gun is locked and unloaded and inaccessible, but they'll still pop you in New York. Then you got to get a criminal lawyer, and then, they, then it gets dismissed. Um, go, to, go to a JFK airport and check in your gun and they'll call the cops, and you say, here's what the federal law says I can do, and they'll say, this is New York, federal law doesn't apply here. That's what happened to one of my clients. So we, there's a lot of progress that needs to be made. More Hello, and thank you for being here today. It, it's been a very informative conversation that you've had with us, and it's actually caused me to think about something. Now, given the fact that we've had, we have a history that we can show demonstrably that the gun control efforts that have been pushed against us over decades have failed. We've seen consistently that items like the red flag laws, like the New York SAFE Act, uh, we can just keep going down the line. Each and every time that they've been put forward, they've always been put forward under the thought, well, you're gonna be safe now. You've lost a little bit of liberty and freedom, but now you're going to be safe. And therefore, but then if we look at the New York GIVE report, if we look at the uh, US in, crime in the USA by the FBI, any of the data that's out there, we see that the numbers are roughly static, if not increasing. Also, um, 
there was the Northeast University professor who also showed that has been historically correct over the last 30 years. Now, here's the thing. Given we have that history, there is a precedent to show that all these ideas they were putting forward are ineffective. And combining that with, and sadly, I didn't know this before today, the black codes, which I would hope have been removed across the nation, but let's say that they have not, can, can't we go at least in one state and then use that as the launching board in many states, or more importantly, uh, on a national level, to try and say, this is a prejudice against citizens, either by race or gender or just in general, and therefore, these laws are invalid, and therefore, we can have them mass repealed or a major injunction over uh, the entire country. So that's the question. I'm sorry if it's a little oddly worded, but also I'd ask, has anyone ever tried that? So, yeah, they, they tried it. It started basically in 1774 in and, and, and Massachusetts and Virginia and other states. So in, in Virginia, across the river here, um, the last royal governor was Lord Dunmore. And he started efforts to disarm the people, as, as did the uh, General Gage, who was head of the British troops in, in Boston. And um, so George Washington formed the Independent Militia Company in Fairfax County. And, and so they, they couldn't do this through the courts. We can't do that part through the courts now. But what we can do, for example, we have this modern Lord Dunmore named Ralph Northam, who's uh, on, on his days off, he either dr goes in blackface or puts on a Klan outfit. Um, and so once he came up with all of his stuff about all the liberties we're gonna take away, we've got almost every county in Virginia to declare themselves either a Second Amendment sanctuary or otherwise to, to um, support the Second Amendment and, and to tell the lawmakers in the General Assembly uh, that we're not gonna go along with this stuff. And so the governor said, well, you have to enforce our laws. The Attorney General did an opinion saying that you gotta enforce our laws. And the sheriffs are saying, no, we don't. And in, and in fact, the, um, some of the Commonwealth attorneys are saying we don't have to enforce the marijuana laws. So what, other ones can just as well say, we don't have to enforce your stupid laws about, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Go to shooting ranges and see if somebody's got one of those deadly muzzle brakes on the end of their rifles. We can send in undercover agents to check that out. And so, no, I mean, we've got popular revolt against what's going on right now. And I think that's the solution. We, we're not going to win in the court on that basis, but we can win politically. Um, so I, I, I'm going to let Dr. Hobbock's answer stand on the, the legal aspect of, you know, sort of the, the attempts to it's say, look, this is our constitutional right and none of this is effective. But I do want to make um, two quick points on some of the other things you, you said there with that question. Um, so the, the first is this idea of, um, you know, the, the government saying, look, you don't need guns. We're going to keep you safe. You know, you're giving up your liberty, but, but we're going to be there for you. Um, so first of all, well, I, I think we all have a tremendous, res we all have a tremendous, is that better? Yeah. We all have a tremendous respect for, for law enforcement. Um, the reality is that, that while I want law enforcement to be there to protect me, I do not cede my natural right to self-defense to the government. Um, that, that's part of you know, the, the security of a free state is one, ensuring that there isn't a government monopoly on the use of force, but two, even if there were a government monopoly on the use of force, it's not effective. Um, so uh, one of the things that I've been doing at the Heritage Foundation is studying defensive gun uses. We've put out um, a, a monthly series highlighting you know, just a dozen or so examples from the month of, of some of the, these great defensive gun uses that otherwise go unpublished. Um, and one of the things that has struck me um, is listening to the 911 calls from some of these scenarios. Um, there's one in particular that I, I don't think will ever sort of leave the back of my mind. There is an individual, so the average response time for law enforcement, even to emergency calls, um, in most jurisdictions is about six to eight minutes, six to eight minutes. Um, and so this individual in Washington state, um, uh, you listen to this 911 call, um, calls 911 immediately, realizes in the dead of night that someone is in his home, and he's whispering to this 911 dispatcher, saying, I'm hiding in my closet. 
I have a gun. I hope to God I don't have to use it. But if this man comes in here, I'm going to have to use it. And you listen to this, this, the terror in this man's voice. Uh, on the phone with this dispatcher, the man does un unfortunately come into the room, attacks him. Um, you can hear him shoot this suspect, um, you know, using his Second Amendment right to enforce his inalienable right to life and liberty. Um, and then what struck me was that you listen to the next six minutes of silence while he is waiting for law enforcement to get there. And I gotta say, six minutes doesn't seem like a lot some days, but when you're listening to a man who just fought for his life, it was an eternity. So this idea that the government is there to protect us in every scenario and that I cede my right to self-defense to them to protect me is absurd and it's un-American. Um, and then quickly, um, again, you touched on this idea of you know, the, the, the black codes. So they have been repealed to the extent of you know, the, no state has a law saying black people cannot own guns. But what you do see, again, not just the, the, the effect of, um, of how you know, when we put barriers in front of people, whether it's May issue or, or all of these other barriers, um, that it you know, disproportionately affects poorer people and minorities and, and people with other responsibilities. But what you also see is a disparity of sentencing is where you, you see this play out. Um, so minorities, particularly young black men and young Hispanic men, um, are very much disproportionately affected by sentencing laws for some of these um, uh, you know, things like carrying without a license, um, that they are disproportionately the people who are being arrested, tried, and convicted for these offenses. Um, and, and I think to me, the, the most absurd example of this, um, just this year, uh, a couple months ago in Decatur, Illinois, um, where it's very, very difficult to, to get a concealed carry license in, in Illinois. You need 16 hours of training. It's roughly $300. You got to wait 90 days for processing. Um, so this, this young woman who had a restraining order against her ex-husband, the ex-husband had already beat her so badly once that she had a shunt in her brain. Um, she has a FOID card, so a, a, a license in Illinois to have a gun in her home. She's a licensed law-abiding gun owner. Um, whose ex-husband is crazy. And so she carries her gun with her in her car to work. The ex-husband finds her, attacks her in her car, starts beating her. She's got a, a number of injuries. Keep in mind, she already has a shunt in her brain. Um, she shoots him, injures him. Law enforcement's called. Of course, they arrest the, the ex-husband for you know, attempted murder. And then they arrest her. And they arrest her not because it wasn't a lawful defensive gun use. No, no one was sitting there going, oh, they, they, she didn't have a right to defend herself. But because she hadn't gone through the process to beg the government for permission to carry a gun in self-defense outside the home. And the kicker is so this happened on a Friday. By Monday, the ex-husband had bailed himself out, and she couldn't afford it, and she was still in jail. That is an unfortunately all too common reality with many of these licensing restrictions. Um, and, and I think that especially is where you see this play out, not in explicit black codes, but in the way that we enforce them still predominantly. You see this with Michael Bloomberg saying things like, yeah, my goal is to disarm young black men. None of them should ever carry guns. Um, that's insane. That's something that for me as a white woman, I'm like, how dare you? If someone said to me, yeah, my goal is to ensure that women are not armed. Get out, get out. That is my right. That's your right. That's your, th that is a right that belongs to us as Americans. Um, and, and so that's where you see that now is in that effect um, of how we enforce those laws. We got time for one more question. One more question. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Stan, and I'm from Colorado. Uh, also, I'm a county official, an elected official, a county commissioner. I want to talk about red flag laws, because we passed a red flag law in, law in Colorado. And there's two things that are kind of interesting. One is about the Second Amendment, but there's another part, and that's the question. But I just want everybody here to know, 39 counties out of 64 counties in Colorado declared themselves a Second Amendment sanctuary county as a result of the state legislation. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, absolutely one of them. Yeah, absolutely. And I voted for, uh, we don't use the word sanctuary in our county. We call it a Second Amendment Protection Order. That was the term we used. Yeah. And uh, we, only, we only have the power of the purse. 
So basically, anybody tries to enact that state law in El Paso County, if we have any budget connected to that organization that did that, we will defund them. That's what we'll do. That's what we have the authority to do. So, but the other question is, these red flag laws also affect due process, which uh, when you don't get due process, it's a violation of the 5th and 14th Amendments because your property is confiscated from you without an opportunity to appeal. And uh, it's a burden on the state to prove you committed a crime as opposed to uh, being told you've committed a crime and you have to prove you're innocent. So I think these things are violations of the 5th and 14th Amendments as well. It seems so obvious to me that that's a violation. I don't know why these things don't get to the Supreme Court and are made invalid immediately. How come that doesn't happen? Well, one thing is you have to have the process of challenging these laws. We couldn't go into court unless we're subject to a red flag order and have standing to challenge it. And the only way that's ever going to go up to the various appellate courts and maybe eventually the Supreme Court, if you have people who are actually uh, targets of those red flag laws, and uh, if these different things happen to them, uh, then they have standing and, um, and they can go the whole way. But we don't know, uh, the Supreme Court itself has stayed out of these kinds of issues of law, which is kind of in domestic relations side of the law. And so whether they'll ever hear a case like that, we have no idea. But you know, the, it used to be the liberals were the people so much in favor of like procedural due process. And now that's been thrown out the window and um, I mean, not, not to mention the Second Amendment issue, but the, 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 op, ha, the right to have notice of, of some adverse consequence and an opportunity to be heard has been so fundamental to due process. And they're not just taking away your, your gun, they're taking away your liberty, your liberty to defend yourself. And so uh, anyway, um, thank you for being here and for telling us about, we, there's other places too, it's Colorado, it's New Mexico. Uh, there's a number of places where uh, people are revolting and saying that we've had enough of this stuff.